Okay. Yes. All right. Well, let's get started while Liz uh, and lets more people in the, they're all in the waiting room. So while she lets them in, I just, um, my name is Laura Martinez. I'm the assistive technology program manager at TASC. And I'm joined by Elizabeth Ortega, our assistive technology specialist, and Adriana Salazar, which is our receptionist at TASC. And I wanted to do a little bit of housekeeping just so that you know um, what's going on. So everyone's mics are muted. If you have questions, we'll have you type them in the chat box. Um, questions related to this, the presented materials, please type in the chat box. If you have questions on anything that's not related, if you could just go ahead and email us, we'll put our email addresses in <clears throat> excuse me, in the chat box, and then it, they're on a slide at the end as well. Um, and we're going to have a survey at the end for you guys to do through SurveyMonkey. And I just want to ask you, please don't ask questions in the SurveyMonkey because we don't see those for about three or four weeks, and we don't want to leave you hanging there. So if you have questions, please email us or ask them in the chat box. Um, what else? Handouts will be posted in chat in about 10 minutes. If for some reason you can't download them or you don't see them, go ahead and um, email Liz. We'll, again, we'll put her um, email address in the chat box or just go ahead and put need handouts and put your email address uh, in the chat box if you want to. Um, yeah, we want to get you the handouts. We do have copies of the PowerPoint, a resource sheet, and several supplemental materials. So we want to make sure everyone gets them. OK. Liz, you want to go ahead, hon? Good morning, and welcome to our AAC Outside the Box webinar. Um, first, I will go over task. Um, we are a parent training information center and empowerment center. We cover six counties in Southern California and our mission is to educate and empower people with disabilities and their families. We offer a variety of services. Um, we help families understand the special education process by providing a variety of workshops, IEP consultations, resources, and information about disability laws, rights, and responsibilities. Uh, any questions or concerns you have regarding your child's education, you can call any of our offices. Our family support specialists will be able to help you if you're looking for something specific that, um, that one of our family support specialists cannot help you with, they'll be able to refer you to someone who will. We also have the tech center. Our tech center is in our Borough office in Orange County. And in the tech center, we offer a variety of assistive technology workshops, now webinars, um, individualized lab appointments. We also offer assistive technology and augmentative alternative communication um, consultations. We are offering a free one hour AAC consultation with a speech language pathologist. That's through our Project Communicate program. Um, if you're interested, you can either email Laura or myself. And we have Tech Connection. Um, Tech Connection is our social life skills group. We meet the third Wednesday of the month. And we have a lot of information and resources. Um, during COVID-19, all of our, most of our services are either by telephone, Zoom, or email. You can talk to a family support specialist. Um, our webinars, we are offering IEP consultations, our assistive technology services, and we have a lot of resources. You can either visit our task website, email us for the resources, or you can also visit our Facebook page. We have Tech Tech Bits, which is a free assistive technology focused e-newsletter that goes out <clears throat> once a month. If you would like to receive it, you can visit the website that's on here. Plug in your email address and you'll start receiving it the following month. Okay, so we're going to start with a quick review for anyone who did not attend the first webinar. Uh, at the end of this webinar, we do have a slide. The the first uh, 
webinar, Let's Talk Low Tech AAC Basics is now available on our YouTube channel for viewing. So we'll go ahead and give you that link at the end if you're interested. And we'll go ahead and get started. So just a quick review. So AAC or Augmentative and Alternative Communication can include all forms of communication <clears throat> other than oral speech that are used to express thoughts, needs, wants, and ideas. And AAC is not just a device that talks, but includes all kinds of things, including applications, symbols, gestures, pictures, icons, um, you name it. Sorry. So there are all different types of AAC, including no tech, which is basically what you have on your body, gestures, body language, sign language, things like that. Low tech can include letter boards, communication books, and uh, systems like PEX, which we'll talk about. Mid tech is generally, uh, are generally devices like this one you see here, the GoTalk. Um, they typically have voice output, they require batteries, they're typically really easy to program, and they have what we call a static display, which means you remove a, a piece of paper and change it out that way. High tech includes speech generating devices that permit storing of messages. They're, they're more complex. Uh, they're typically, they use a power supply like they usually plug in, and they're a dynamic display, meaning I push, push a folder that says food, another folder pops up that lists breakfast, lunch, and dinner, uh, and so on. So who uses AAC? Well, AAC is helpful for anyone that's unable to use their speech in order to get their needs met. And this can include individuals with all different uh, impairments, and there are no prerequisite skills needed for AAC use. Sorry, my thing wouldn't turn. Okay, AAC where? Where do you use AAC? Well, you should be using, if it's someone that this is their voice, you should be using it everywhere. You're going to use AAC across all settings. So here are some different boards and a keychain. Uh, one is for the park, another is lunchtime, one is for the beach, and then uh, the one down here at the bottom is used for functional communication. That looks like the steps in using the restroom. So why do we use AAC? So yes, it allows for functional communication, like I need help or I need to go to the restroom, but it also should promote speech development, language development, uh, improved behavior because now we can communicate, social interaction, literacy, literacy skills and independence. So all of that allows the student to access their curriculum more easily and more independently. So what type of responses are we looking for? So people typically start with requesting, I want that, you know, or functional communication, I'm hungry, I need to go to the bathroom, I need help. But we're also looking for social interaction, commenting, hey, I like your shirt. Um, protesting, no, I do not like that. Um, participating in different activities, choice making, and then can whatever else you can think of. It should be just like any, you know, anyone else that has, uh, can speak verbally. And I really like this quote, uh, having a communication device doesn't make you a f an effective communicator any more than having a piano makes you a musician. So we all need to learn and practice with whatever our communication device or system is, which means we need to teach. And this is a, a graphic. Um, I like it because it's, uh, it says AAC users need access to colorful language. Can they maintain a conversation? Can they initiate a conversation? Hey, I went to the park yesterday. What did you do? 
Um, can they uh, deny, protest, or refuse? Can they tell a joke? Can they complain? Complaining is important, especially if you have a teenager, let me tell you. Um, can they use different strategies when they're misunderstood? So we need to think about all these things when uh, we're looking at communication in general, but especially with someone who's using augmentative communication. So I love this graphic that says, what? You're saying there's more to communication than I want cookie? I have more to say, I'm asking a question. Where are the cookies? That's more important, right? Uh, these were graphics were put together by Lauren Enders. She's a speech language pathologist that specializes in AAC. Um, if you're a Pinterest user, I always recommend that you look her up. So how do we begin? So we need motivators. Some people. Um, we're going to talk about prompting and fading. We're going to talk about aided language stimulation and or modeling. And the graphic up here, wait expectantly. Sometimes silence is the best way to encourage AAC use. Sometimes when you're working with someone that uses a device or a board or um, a different method of communication, uh, people tend to try to speed them up by speaking for them or finishing their sentence or and they end up interrupting their train of thought. Just wait and let them say what they want to say. So motivators can look different for each person. You can use reinforcers like tangible items like, um, you know, whatever works for them. Sometimes it can be a desired activity or a desired outcome or rewards, a, di a desired activity might be they get to watch part of their favorite video, or they get to take a break, or whatever that looks like for the individual. And then, of course, rewards or motivators <laughs> can be food or toys or something they like. You can use a token board, they do so many things and they get a reward you know, a reward, just um, whatever works for the individual. So the goal of AAC is always spontaneous novel utterance generation, meaning the communicator will have independent spontaneous communication. That is to say what they want, when they want, to who they want. Sometimes communicators are given all nouns. Well, maybe they don't want to say motorcycle cow house. Maybe they want to use actual sentences or maybe the choice that they want is not there. So you want to make sure that they have access to the language they need. So how do we all learn? We all learn by modeling. When we're growing up, we watch our parents, we watch our teachers, we watch other kids. Um, and basically, re I like this statistic. Research indicates that it takes between 2,000 and 10,000 observations for a typically developing child to acquire a language structure. Now, we need to expect the same from our AAC users. So you're going to model different communicative functions repeatedly. So you're gonna, we're gonna talk about this uh, in a little bit, but you're gonna point and say what, you know, what you're talking about so that they know where the words are and we'll talk about motor planning in a little bit. So how do we model? So this is a little bit detailed and I won't do the whole thing, but basically when you're modeling language, you're going to not point to every single symbol for every single word because that gets monotonous. You want to, uh, so if someone's using their AAC system or board or whatever it looks like, you're gonna start modeling one symbol at a time or maybe two to three symbols per sentence. So 
there's some examples here. Tell me about what you did. So you might just point to the word what. Or um, that's very funny, and you're going to point to the word funny. So again, the underlying text indicate the word you might model on, on whatever system or device <clears throat> the individual is using. So you're going to get a clear copy of this in your uh, handouts. This is one of the supplemental handouts. But this shows the AAC prompting hierarchy. So when you're using AAC and someone's learning where all their symbols are, um, this is kind of a, a least to most, which is what they want. You, they don't want you to, um, to start with too, mu too much prompting because then they become prompt dependent. So the first thing you want to do is motivate. So what will motivate your participant to communicate for. Then you want to wait and give them time to process the request and come up with a response. Gesture, direct their atten the attention um, of the user to the device. Move the device closer to them and look expectantly. And just wait. Then you're going to point to the icon. If that doesn't work. And then you might want to ask an open-ended question. So not a yes or no question, like, what do you think? And then wait. You might want to give a direction and say, um, I want blank. Your turn. And then finally, um, modeling what you would expect them to say. If you don't get a response, you're going to ask them to put their hands on the table ready their hand, maybe by a touch of the elbow to support their hand or their um, arm, and or you might touch them under their wrist, and then you might increase motivation. These are just ideas for prompting. So this is um, something we call s'mores, and Liz, they're going to get this in their handouts as well, correct? Yes, they are. Okay. So this is just uh, another support for modeling. So S is for slow speech rate. Speak slowly and clearly. The MO is for modeling while you're pointing. R is respect and reflect. So you're going to honor that person's gestures and approximations while modeling the word phrase to communicate. So don't make them repeat. Not at this time. Next, you're going to repeat targeted utterances frequently. You said, I like that. Then you want to expand, build upon the adult or the student's utterance by adding a word or two. So if the student says go, you might say, yes, it's time to go to the bus. Or where do you want to go? And then you're going to stop and provide that pause to allow them time to respond. And one of the big things for us is always presume competence and allow the student time to process and respond. Liz, do we have any questions at this point? No. OK. Have you posted the handouts in the? Yes, I did. OK. So for those that are that are joining late, the handouts are in the chat box. If for any reason you cannot access them or download them from your device, just go ahead and email us and we'll be happy to email them to you afterward. So we're going to talk about different, um, I just drew a blank in the word, <laughs> different processes for um, augmentative communication. And the first one we're going to talk about is LAMP, which stands for Language Acquisition Through Motor Planning. And LAMP is a therapeutic approach based on the neurological and motor learning principles. So basically, you want to be able to give folks that need, that have limited or nonverbal abilities, a method to independently express themselves. And again, there are no co cognitive prerequisites for the implementation of LAMP. I think
think I should have drank more coffee. The la la la. Okay. Um, so the LAMP approach involves five basic components. I have here uh, two really great links that explain it in detail. But basically, it's readiness to learn, shared engagement, consistent motor patterns, which we're going to talk about in just a minute, auditory signals if possible, and then natural consequences. So this is an example of a AAC board or device from Prentke Romic using the Unity language system. So at the top, you can see there are a lot of symbols. Uh, sometimes for folks, starting out with that many symbols is overwhelming and trying to find the symbol you want can be frustrating. So what we do is hide certain words and just use core words or just use, use some words. So if you can see at the, the top, sorry, I have something blocking. There you go. If you can see at the top and see at the bottom, if you look for certain words, they're in the, a similar place. So if you look for I, it's going to be in a similar place here. And the same thing, like, going to be in a similar position here. So what that does is, for your motor planning, you don't have to look for each symbol. I equate it to when you're using a um, regular QWERTY keyboard for typing. If they took all your letters and rearranged them all, then you would have to search and hunt for each letter you were looking for. But you know that the L is always going to be in the same place, and you know that the A is going to always be in the same place. So that helps with the motor planning. So I hope that makes sense. I'm going to show a video in just a minute. So here's a video example of motor planning for this little girl that's using a device. Right row. I clicked on it. There we go. Sorry about the lag time. There we go. Maya, do you remember over the weekend when you were sick? Sorry. Yeah, do you remember your head hurt? Yeah. What did I give you to make you feel better? So Maya wants to say medicine, but the word isn't lit up. So if you watch her finger, she's going to scan where medicine should be the same way you have the motor plan to type your name without looking at the keyboard. Medicine. <gasps> I gave you some medicine? There. Medicine. <gasps> I gave you some medicine? Mm. Did it taste good or bad? Yeah. Bad? Yeah. Did it? Okay, so you get the idea. And I put the YouTube links and they're all live on your handout so that uh, you can watch, especially the ones that we don't get to. So we're going to talk about uh, vocabulary and how it's arranged on different AAC systems and boards and devices. Uh, the typical coding, the color coding, is uh, called the Fitzgerald key, but there are other ones that have been put together by other people. But basically, for most um, 
symbol systems or devices, the yellow is usually the who. So people, pronouns, whatever the subject of the, the sentences. The green are typically verbs or action words. Uh, nouns are usually things, objects, or the what. Um, blue typically are describing words like small, um, colors, how you feel, just different adjectives and adverbs. Um, either purple or pink are typically social or aware. And then there are miscellaneous little words. So I'm going to show you examples of color coding. I know that's a lot on one slide, sorry. Um, for different symbol systems. And the top two and the bottom left are all using the Fitzgerald key or modified somehow. And then the bottom right, I think they kind of did their own thing. They have their own color coding system going on. But I wanted to show you that most of them are similar. Also, I don't know if you noticed, but most boards or devices are set up with the symbols left to right, like you would write a sentence. So I can, you know, whatever, go to, so it goes across, like you would write a sentence from left to right. Okay, we're going to talk about a little bit more about core and fringe words. I know we touched on it in the first webinar, but basically core words are a small number of words that you use the most throughout the day. They're usually usually used across all situations, cultures, and they're applicable to children and adults. Fringe or activity specific words, there's a huge number, infinite number of words. They're mostly nouns and they're, they can be uh, user specific to the vocabulary or, or the situation you're using. So my example is, can we go to Starbucks and get a latte? So the greener core and the redder fringe. There's our latte, virtual latte. And here's a video about core words. Lag time. Okay. Let me try it again, just in case. Now we'll probably get two. Hi, I'm Deanna Wagner, and I'm a speech-language pathologist and assistive technology specialist in Phoenix, Arizona. As we think about how to organize a communication system for somebody, the first thought needs to be, how do we help them access the most frequently used words? There are 250 to 350 words that make up 85% of what we all say, and we refer to this as core vocabulary. To explain core vocabulary, let's think of a few examples. I like your hair. I like pizza. I don't. Think of those words. I and you are core words. So are like and don't. And we put them in different order. We can express some pretty basic things and that's why we call this core. Now let's take a look at what are fringe words. Think of this sentence. I like chocolate. Or this one. I like baseball. Chocolate and baseball are the fringe words. Core words need to be accessed really quickly because we use them all the time. And fringe words need to be organized. We would find chocolate with all of our favorite foods. Or we may even find them in a category of desserts. As a child's communication skills grow, the system needs to reflect how they can combine words in novel ways to make messages that are their own. 
the system needs to be organized in a way that helps them to access these words without taking too much time. Okay, so that's core vocabulary versus French. <clears throat> so another statistic. Um, I love this. Think about this. The average 18-month-old has been exposed to 4,380 hours of oral language at the rate of eight hours a day from birth. A child who has a communication system that receives speech-language therapy two times a week for 20 to 30 minutes will reach the same amount of language exposure in AAC language in 84 years. That's pretty devastating. So we're going to show you how to speed that up. I thought this was interesting talking about core language. Uh, so this is toddler, typical toddler vocabulary arranged by frequency. And so these 26 core words compromise 96% of the total words used by toddlers in the study. Of course, the first first word is I and the second word is no. I was surprised those weren't reversed, honestly, but um, <laughs> basically those are the words used the most. So we're going to do an activity. So this is a core board and I want to see how many two to three word phrases you can make with this core board. So I'm going to have you, what did we decide, Liz? Type one sentence in the chat box? Yes. All right. So it could be, I want more. I go bathroom. You open. Somebody's saying they can't see the handouts. If you joined late, you won't be able to see anything that was posted before you joined. Good, I see a lot of, a lot of great sentences. Good, great, you guys, thank you. So you can see that there's a lot of great, yeah, perfect. Great, guys. So I just wanted to illustrate just with these few core words that you can say a lot. And then when you combine that with a topic-specific uh, vocabulary, you can say even more. Liz, can you post the handouts one more time, hun? I will. Thanks. Okay, we're going to go ahead and move on. Thanks for all the great input. So here's topic-specific vocabulary. We figured out yesterday that this must be from a, not from California because um, we have never seen cinnamon melts and we call it soda, not pop. But um, this is language specific to McDonald's over here, but I'm also glad they added the I want, please, thank you, all done, yes, no, and the sizes. Also, my choice isn't here. That's important. Here's an example of communication for a child in the bath. You could take a board like this put it in a large baggie to waterproof it, use a couple suction cups and put it on the side of the um, tub or the shower. Um, or you could put it on a kickboard, floating kickboard, 
do the same thing and they have their language in their tub. Here's an example of uh, something for an adult that has to do with hygiene or their needs, just to give you different ideas. I love this. Get me off this board. Okay. Next, we're going to talk about what we call AAC alphabet soup. There's a lot of acronyms in, um, well, as you know, in special education, but also in uh, the AAC world or the AT world. So we're going to talk about two different things. So the first thing is PECS, and PECS stands for the Picture Exchange Communication System. Now, PECS is a specific communication system. It's not just the little cards or pictures. The little cards or symbols can be used in many other systems. So PECS is specifically, or was specifically developed to teach functional communication. And there's a website here for PECS USA that has a lot of great information. So I included in the slides probably more than I should have, but um, the six phases of PECS, basically you start with discrimination and initiation. So whoever the learner is needs to learn to exchange single pictures for items or activities they really want. So I hand you a picture of a cookie and you're going to hand me a cookie. Good deal, right? Next comes distance and persistence, which means you're still going to use those single pictures and exchange, but now you're going to use different people and across distances. So basically, you can use it with other people, people other than your communication partner. Um, next comes picture discrimination. So you have to select from two or more pictures to ask for different things. Typically then we go to a book, a PEX book, which we're gonna show you um, pictures of, um, and they have Velcro on them so that they're easily stored and um, taken out. Then come sentence structures. We're gonna say, I want, you know, a blue car or whatever it is. Next, you're going to do responsive requesting, which is answering questions. What do you want? Are you hungry? And then finally comes com commenting. So basically, they're going to answer questions and comment on them. So what do you see? What do you hear? And then they're going to learn to make up sentences starting with, I see, I hear, I feel. It's a... Uh, blank. So here are some examples of how PECS may look. So the first one is requesting an item. Down lower are different PECS books. Um, they can be set up differently depending on the user. At the bottom of each PECS book there is a sentence strip. Did I miss a, I missed a video, I'm sorry. This little guy's cute too. Possibly, you're gonna possibly see it. Uh, <laughs> you are, I want more. I want whipped cream, please. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, no, it's silly. Hi, Parker. <laughs> Do you want water or juice? Ayo. A juice? Ayo. All right, we'll get some juice. Good job, buddy. Our default is water. Do you want straw? Mama. Oh, what color? Blue or orange? 
So that was an example of simple requesting. I appreciate Oh, well. Okay, we're going to go ahead and skip because I messed up. So again, back to the PEX books. And then here is another example of PEX um, using the sentence strip again and prompting. all the trains now. Okay. Whoops. So that was just another example of using PEX. So next we're going to go on to POD. And POD stands for Pragmatic Organization Dynamic Display. Uh, basically, uh, I'm going to show you the video so you can get an idea. This is a family who has three children that use pod all in different ways. So you're going to be seeing two videos of them. But basically it's a book with many pages that um, there's a systematic way of accessing them. And that's what I'm going to show you with this video. And this is Harper. So while it's loading, if you look up We Speak Pod, you'll find a bunch on YouTube, you'll find a bunch of videos of this Owens family. And the mom, the dad, and the older sister all are great partners, communication partners. Now, how do you tell mom? Harper has something to say, more to say. I like this. It's funny. Oh my goodness. It's funny. Back to page one. Oh, more to say. Let's go. Turn the page. Maybe, oops, made a mistake. We go back a page. Look. Let's go outside activity. Outside activity. Turn the page. The sandbox. Oh, I have something to say. No, I have something to say. Uh oh. Oh no. That was oops, made a mistake. I think. That was a oops made a mistake. More to say. I like this. Funny. I have something to say. Back to page one. You are funny. You are funny. Angela's fussing. Let's be. Okay, you're going to see more of Angela in a minute. That was Harper. Could you hear that okay? Yes. Okay. 
So here are some different examples of pod. Uh, Liz and I have been doing an extensive pod uh, training, which has been really fun. But there are single page books like this, or there are two page books, or there's a third one that has the two pages plus an index on the side, which is really helpful. Um, and you can use it in different settings. So Angela uh, d cannot do direct access. So her mom does uh, auditory scanning or partner assisted scanning. And so I wanted you to see this, plus it's funny. She's got a little teenage attitude thing going. Love her. have something to say. I'm telling you something. Sorry. Thing. It already happened. Categories. Activities. No touching. Activities. You are not. Another word on this page allowed to play with your iPad. Yes. <laughs> That's all I have to say about that. Oh. Do you have anything to say? Yes. Quick chat, something's wrong, I think it's. No. I want, let's go do something. No. Oh, yes. Did you change your mind? Yes. I want, let's go do something. Yes, I want, yes, you want something, not equipment, take a break, bathroom, music, a book, iPad, TV video, outside activity, yes, iPad, yes, did you make a mistake, do you have another word, is it all you have to say, yes. Hmm, what did I just say? Not iPad. Another word, back to page one. Let's see. I think I didn't like. Hey, over here. Angela. Over here. I didn't like how you were acting. Let's see, you were a little naughty. Just a little bit. That's okay. Back to page one, quick chat. Turn the page. I still love you. I'm telling you something, that's always happening. I love you. Do you have anything else to say? Hand up. Quick chat, something's wrong, I think it's. Yes, a quick chat? Yes, quick chat. Me, you. That's it. Anyway, Angela wanted her iPad. So I just wanna say we're just showing you the different strategies that are out there. And it's not uh, one size fits all. So basically, we're just showing you different things that are available and different strategies. But this does not replace having an augmentative alternative or an AAC assessment done by a speech and language pathologist who understands AAC. It's really important uh, to make sure you have the right um, system for each user. So here are just a couple different pictures of people using AAC across different things on the playground, looks like at the dentist, and then one of my favorites, AAC can stand for Always Available Communication. I hear a lot of times that, oh, he has a communication device, but they only bring it out during 
this time or that time. No, if somebody has a communication system, they need to be able to use it all the time. So Liz, did we have any other questions? Okay. So you're gonna get this, actually you're gonna get this as a handout, three different, that looks three different ways. Um, I liked them all, so you're getting them all. I'm big on resources. Um, so here are just different implementation steps. So the first thing you wanna do is get familiar with AAC and understand the different types and why it's important. Um, next, you wanna look at uh, access. How are they gonna access or have access to their system, whatever that is, at all times? You always want to make sure you model. You want to focus your efforts on teaching and modeling core vocabulary instead of situation specific words. Fringe words are great, but the core vocabulary is what you're going to use, you know, 90% of the time. And then you want to um, consistently provide communication opportunities for people who use AAC all throughout the day. <clears throat> So here are just some ideas or tips for teaching core vocabulary. Like if you're in a classroom or whatever your situation is, if you put core boards throughout the different areas, um, you always want to have a core board available along with your fringe board. So if you're in the reading center, this looks like a reading board, um, you want to have both boards available. Same thing in the kitchen or the sensory area, or the restroom. Here's a, just an example of a topic-specific activity board. So this is Play-Doh. So this could be an overlay on a mid-tech communication device. This could be um, language that's on a high-tech device. This could be printed out on a board and laminated. Here's one for Mr. Potato Head, and it's available free through Teachers Pay Teachers. If you don't already know about Teachers Pay Teachers, you do need to sign up for an account, which is free. And there are many, many, many uh, boards and activities and all kinds of cool things that you can download. There are many also that cost, but if you type in the word free and then whatever you're looking for, those will pop up. Or if you're looking for something specific, um, you might want to email myself or Liz because we have a lot of the, <laughs> the boards or links to a lot of the boards. So this is a cute board I saw. This is one that's uh, basically just the outside <clears throat> and the middle is free. So this would be an art for an art project and then you have room in the middle for the actual project. So this might be a laminated placemat. And then you have your art project in the middle and they can say, I want purple glitter. I want to use orange paint. I need help. I'm all done. Another idea for implementation is wearing your AAC. So for teachers, for parents, for therapists, for whoever you are, even the user, there are all kinds of different ways to wear your augmentative communication. So here they show an apron <clears throat> that's made out of Veltex material and the things that are um, stuck on it are stuck with Velcro. We have lots and lots of different uh, keychains that you can print out or make. Hang them on the lanyard so you have them right around your neck. This is another apron with actually a communication core board that's printed on it. This is a flip and talk. No, not flip and talk. What's it called? I have to think. Um, I think it is. And it's basically a bracelet that goes on you and you can have access to different communication symbols. Up top here is a pod book that's hanging around somebody's neck with um, using some sort of a 
cord. And then down here, <clears throat> we showed these in the first one, but I just love them. They're communication bracelets. And you can buy them through Toby Dynavox, but you can also make your own. You can buy snap bracelets at the party store or um, Oriental Trading or somewhere inexpensively. And you can print out symbols and tape them on with the clear, uh, the thick clear tape. So different ideas for wearing your AAC. So some ideas for literacy or reading or learning to read while using augmentative communication. So if you have a single message, single button device, you might want to record the letter sound or say a repeated phrase or line. We like to use um, brown bear. So you could record brown bear, brown bear, what do you see? And then if you have multi-level, you might want to say brown bear, brown bear, what do you see? And then hit it again. I see a whatever looking at me. Um, you can also give directions using a sequential me message device. Um, tell, you know, discuss what you did that day, things like that. If you're using a digitized speech, gen speech generating device, you can make predi predictions about the story or answer questions or even retell the story somewhat. For a core language communication board, um, we're going to show you an example, but you can use to model when talking to the students. And they can have them um, point to their own words or you can point to them. And then another idea that I love, which we have done, with multiple books is you can place communication symbols on the books before reading. So that picture was too small, so I just did a, a big picture so you can see. <clears throat> so depending on the book, you can print out the words and the symbols um, and paste them right on the book so that they're there to help with reading support. Or what we've done with some of our books is just left the actual uh, writing that's on there and just paste the, the symbols up at the top or up in a different place. So some examples for AAC and literacy, modeling repetitive lines. I have two different videos here. Liz likes the brown bear one, so we're gonna do the brown bear. Now for brown bear or for any book with repetitive lines, you could have, again, different ones programmed in a device. At work, we have a go talk. Is it the nine or the 20, Liz? Nine. The nine with the different brown bear phrases. All right, let's read our book. Brown bear, brown bear, what do you see? Let's turn it. Oh, that's like your talker. Brown bear, brown bear, what do you see? I see a hmm, red bird looking at me. Let's turn it. Let's find out. Oh, ooh, it's a red bird. Red bird, red bird, what do you see? Hmm, what do you see? It's just like on your talker. I see a yellow duck looking at me. Oh, there's a yellow duck. So you get the idea. There's all different ways that you can do this. Uh, these are just ideas. And then there's another video you're welcome to watch. Silly book. Using core vocabulary and activity-based instruction. This is a really vi a good video, but it's on the long side. But I wanted to include it for your use. 
This is Gail Van, T Van, Van Tatenhove, Blech, easy for me to say, and she is um, an AAC guru that's been around for years. She's wonderful, and she does an activity with um, this adult or teenager uh, using uh, different methods. So not sure how many of you use uh, work with adults versus children, but I wanted to put in considerations when you're implementing with an adult or with an older child or a teenager. You want to take different things into account. Well, this can be used across the board as well, but um, you want to uh, look at their communication setting especially those that might require specific words or vocabulary. So if you're going to talk about work or church or special clubs or social groups, um, you might want to add those specific vocabularies. So um, you also want to, if you have someone that's literate that can read, they may not need the symbols. They may want a text-based board or system. So here's just examples of specific vocabulary that maybe you use. The top line is for fishing. Maybe those are words that you might want to use if you're fishing. Uh, the second one is for um, maybe a grandparent. Ideas that maybe things they want to talk about with their friends or their neighbors or their, you know, whoever they are with their kids. And then the bottom row are breakfast choices. So even if you're not literate or can't read, you can look at the pictures and point to what you want. And you can do this in any situation. Liz said my microphone's making noise. I'm trying to, did it stop? Right now, yes. Okay, I'm holding it. <laughs> ah. We'll see if that works. Okay, do we have any questions up to this point about anything we talked about? Okay, so we're going to look at things to consider when you're building a communication system for someone. And we talked about uh, this a little bit in the first uh, webinar, but Basically, you want to take a lot of things into account when you're building a communication system. Uh, if someone has a high-tech device like an iPad or something like that, they can't always use that in every situation. You wouldn't want to take your iPad or high-end communication device into a pool or to the beach or something like that and risk having it get ruined. So most of the time you want a low-tech backup of some sort. And that can be done in many ways. So I just showed diff up here pictures of different types of communication. Again, here's PEC system. This is a neat flip book that we got from attainment company where you can put different um, categories, different things in there, and then the little colored tabs. I don't know if you can see them. You can organize them by language or by subject. On the right here is a, an eye gaze, low-tech eye gaze system. Bottom right, here's a two button um, from AbleNet. The middle, we have these, we have all of them. They're put out by, um, oh, I just forgot it. It's the Rhett, Rhett Syndrome. Dot org, I think it is, or reds.org. They're great communication books. If you're interested, email me and I'll find you the link. And then again, lots of these that have, um, that you can carry on a belt loop or you can carry on around a necklace, depending on what you're doing, that have different vocabularies. So we're going to consider the icon field number, meaning how many icons to include per page. So you're going to look at the person. I have student, but it can be anyone. You're going to look at their cognitive level. So if they have greater cognitive needs, you might want to start with fewer icons, a smaller field, and then you don't have as much to process at once. 
um, you also want to look at their linguistic level. So someone with a higher level may need to access a broader range of vocabulary or icons. A larger field is going to have more icons and maximize the use of each page, but again, it's a lot to look at. There's a um, really good article from ASHA that I put down here, um, Considerations for Building a Communication Book. Next, we're going to look at icon size. So you're going to consider two factors. One is their visual skills. So someone with some uh, visual impairment of some sort are going to need larger symbols. Um, someone like me who wears glasses might need larger symbols. Um, you also might look at bright colors and potentially a black background so it pops out more. Um, for fine motor skills, you're going to look at um, if you have trouble with your motor planning or your motor skills, you might also want to look at larger icons and put more white space around the icons and we'll show you what that looks like. And so that way you have more, <laughs> more leeway or more space to, to hit the targeted icon. Again, there's that thing. So I know this is a lot to look at, but I wanted just to show you the difference. So this is a comparison of grid sizes. So the one on the left is 7 by 11. So 7 down and 11 across. And the one next to it is 5 by 9. Both have a lot of vocabulary. Um, in a lot of situations, you're going to have even less vocabulary, but I wanted to show you kind of what the difference looks like. Now you see there's not much white space around each icon. There's a way to do that. And I'm going to show you a couple pictures in just a minute. So you also want to consider the communication settings. So where are you going to be using your communication system? Also language functions. Are they going to be requesting, protesting, informing, asking questions? What vocabulary are you going to need, depending on your situation? So if you're going to go to a restaurant, does your AAC board have the word straw or napkin? If they're going to visit this olive vineyard here. Things you can include or should include. Number one is going to be core vocabulary. That should make up the bulk of your book. But then you want to add fringe vocabulary um, because it's got to fit all different needs. So here are different examples. So you might want to have a home page with core words. Then you might want to have a page with action words, different people, places, your personal information. My name is, I am blank, years old, you know, I like dogs, whatever it is. Greetings and social exchanges or a quick chat. Hey, how you doing? Um, or yeah, quick chats. I have to go to the bathroom. And then a page with feelings. These are just examples of other items, different food or drinks, adjectives, body parts, clothing, um, question words. Age-appropriate slang, school-specific activities, home-specific activities. We have had adults that ask us to put curse words in there because maybe they're, they like those. So here's some examples of alternative spacing to support direct access. So the one on the left is sort of in that... Um, why am I drawing a blank? In that curve shape, and the one on the right is more linear, but they both have spaces around them so that if you need to press it, you can make sure they get on the actual um, icon that they want. And for different people, different ones are easier for them to look at, the layouts. And if I asked you all, it would probably be split 50-50 down the middle. Um, you can access these free boards at the ACE Center. They're in the UK, so some of the 
wording might be a little bit different. Here are some more from the ACE Center. This, these are examples of high contrast for people with low vision. So the black with the bright colored symbols or the yellow background instead of white is helpful. Again, you have a little more space around each symbol to make it easier to click on. So I put in some info on um, introducing low-tech AAC system to clients. So obviously the most important part of introducing the system happens before you see them. You have to know the system that you're going to be showing them because you don't want to be hunting for words and trying to figure it out while you're trying to teach them. So find out what words you have access to. Is there a general theme or environment or age range that it's suited for? And how do you expect the consumer to access the vocabulary? Are they going to point? Are they going to tap? Are they going to push? Are they going to nod their head? Are they going to raise their hand? It just depends on the consumer. Uh, next, you're going to tell them what you have. You know, I have a communication board that's going to help me understand you better. Maybe it's someone that's had a stroke or someone that's got aphasia, um, someone that speaks, um, disarth you know, dysarthrically that you can't understand. And then you're going to model that expected behavior. So you're going to use that system just like you would want them to use it so they can see the potential ease in using that system. This is a video that I included on training your communication partner. It's basically a um, pretty much a review of what we've talked about today, but it's all put together in one video. It's about four and a half minutes long, so I encourage you to take a look at it when you have time. Boot camp. So I love this. This was put together by a bunch of people that are um, well known in the AAC world. You're going to get a copy that looks a little different from this because it's um, portrait, letter sized, but basically the same information. I love to keep this up in our center and give one to everyone because this is really important when using um, or when talking to somebody that uses augmentative communication. So you don't expect them to know how to communicate with, without first showing them how. Um, and don't talk so much that you forget to let them talk. Don't prompt every second. Remember, we have to wait. Sometimes it's really hard to wait, but you need to wait. Um, and don't leave their system somewhere they can't access it. It does no good if it's in their backpack or in their locker or you left it at home. Um, always, always, always model. Presume competence. Assume they can do it, because they can. Wait 10 to 20 seconds before re-prompting. Count in your head, not out loud. <laughs> and then you want to follow that prompt hierarchy like we talked about earlier. And again, you want to teach them uh, direct action so they can do what they need to do. Color coding the parts of speech is, is really helpful when you're trying to find words you know where to go. And then again make sure they have access to the, their words at all times. So we included some other project ideas. This is a cookie sheet communication board. Uh, I love this idea. If you don't have anything, uh, this is a link. You can print out symbols from anywhere you want, Google, whatever it is, pictures, if they do better with pictures. Um, put magnets on the back, and you have a communication board that they can move things around, just like we used to use the letter magnets on the refrigerator, kind of the same concept. This is a great one. Uh, Liz found this, and we actually use these a lot. 
This is, these are communication behavioral cue cards. So it might be used by a parent or a teacher or also a participant. If you go to Victories and Autism under Visual Tools, you can find this. And what I like about this one is, if you can see in this picture, when each sheet has six of the same item on it, so it's enough to make six different booklets. We laminate ours, but if you don't have a laminator, my favorite trick is to use clear shelf liner or contact paper. I get mine at Walmart. It's just clear and it peels off and you can laminate with that as well. Here are some templates for eye gaze. There are a bunch more at the Sun Teacher website for those who need eye gaze. And for low tech, you could just print out one of these, cut a hole in the middle, slide it into a um, sheet protector, a clear sheet protector, and there you have eye gaze. I included a bunch of AAC project resources just because I love <laughs> I love things. These, um, I love free. It's my favorite price. There are different pre-made boards, different printables, uh, AAC core flip book you can make, a wearable core board, and then Saltillo has a bunch of low-tech communication board options that you can print out for free. So we are going to open it up for questions and answers that pertain to this workshop specifically. If you have other questions, please email Liz or myself and I'll be glad to help you out. While you're typing your questions in the chat, I do want to let you know again if you missed part one of this series. Um, it's now available on TASK's YouTube channel and I have the link here. Again, it will be in your handouts. You can click it. If you have any trouble, go ahead and email us. And if you look up, if you just want to look up the YouTube channel, it's under Task PTI, because we're a Parent Training and Information Center. Um, please be sure to fill out your workshop evaluation form. Um, Liz is going to cut and paste the SurveyMonkey link into the chat box. Or you can use our QR code. With the QR code, you just use your camera, open up, you can use your phone or device, open up your camera, hold it over the QR code, and it'll take you right to the SurveyMonkey link. I don't know if you guys see that. All of the webinar evaluations will be put into a drawing for a $25 gift card. So be sure to include your contact information when you fill out the SurveyMonkey survey so that we can notify you if you win. Also, again, if you have questions, please don't put them in the SurveyMonkey um, because we don't see those for three to four weeks and we don't want to leave you hanging for that long. So please email us if you have that. Liz, did we have any questions? No. Okay. Wow. Okay. Again, if you would like to email us privately, uh, there's my email address, laurasm at taskca.org, or you can email elizabeth at lizo at taskca.org. And I'll go ahead and put the SurveyMonkey link up. And I thank you for attending today. Liz, do we have the link up in the chat? I can't see the chat. Yet. Yes, I sent it. I'll send Thank it you. again. Thank you. Hun. Really quick for everyone who left their email address on the chat asking for the handouts, I will send them to you in about one hour.
Thank you all for joining. And again, if you didn't get to attend part one, I'll encourage you to go watch the uh, playback. I can't guarantee how good it is because it was our first one. <laughs> I think I was nervous, but we'll see. And again, if you want to contact Liz or myself, we're here. We'll be glad to send you the handouts. Make sure we have your email address though. Gloria, if you could put your email address in there or email us. And we ended early. Oh, okay, from parents' place. I'm going to leave chat up just a few more minutes in case they want the handouts and weren't able to get them. And thank you all for attending. If you're done, you can go ahead and exit. Or you can hang out with us. It's up to you. Yep, you can get the handouts, just make sure to put in your... Yes, our phone number is 714-533-8275. Yeah, the toll-free one is just in here, but you can use the 714, absolutely. Adriana is waiting for your call. Oh, thank you, Susie. Okay, and if you know anyone that you think would benefit, this should be up on our website, I would say in about three weeks, hopefully sooner, but that's up to our IT guy. Thank you all. We really appreciate your attendance. Again, please feel free to reach out if you have questions.